One developed his racing skills on a motorcycle, while the other drove a truck by trade. Both ended up two-time Grand National Champions with very different styles. Join us on NASCAR Past Champions as we look at two early superstars, Herb Thomas and Joe Weatherly. Next. <laughs> They were two contrasting personalities whose paths crossed during the early days of NASCAR racing. One was the clown prince of the sport, and the other epitomized the Southern gentleman. Hi, and welcome to NASCAR Past Champions. I'm Mike Joy. Herb Thomas was an early pioneer, the pilot of the famed Hudson Hornet. Joe Weatherly never took too much seriously, except on the racetrack. But what the two had in common was a hunger to win and two NASCAR championships apiece. Herb Thomas fell in love with driving anything from an early age. His first job as truck driver was delivering goods across North Carolina. When he heard about Bill France organizing NASCAR, Herb jumped at the chance to try his skills as a race car driver. Probably one of the, most, one of the nicest men you'd ever meet. Um, down home, uh, very shy, uh, didn't say a lot, uh, but boy, his talent. Uh, came out on the race track. Herb was a, a true Southern gentleman, a uh, very quiet individual. Uh, didn't, sort of like Bobby Isaac, he didn't uh, uh, pursue publicity. He just assumed not to get interviewed. He, he just wanted to do his thing, let, let his uh, foot do the talking on the racetrack, and he could flat do that. He could really drive a race car. Herb became synonymous with the car he drove through his career, the fabulous Hudson Hornet. It was the car of its era. Sort of like taking an old hound dog to a pedigree show with poodles. I mean, you don't expect the hound dog to win anything. And the Hudson was like that. It just, people just didn't expect the Hudson to win. And Herb Thomas and some other guys won with those Hudson Hornets. He drove those Hudson Hornets in the early 50s and was just a dogged competitor. Um, very, very tough guy. Laid back, sort of quiet, but a very, very stout race car driver. He was injured real badly uh, one year, I forget which it was. I think it might have been 53. And uh, there was doubt he had ever raced again. And they told him if he did race, he was going to be out months and months and months. Well, just maybe a couple of months later, a few weeks, he was racing again. Herb did drive again. In 1951, Hudson teamed Thomas with innovative crew chief Smokey Unick. Unick's engines powered Herb to win the prestigious Southern 500 that year and propelled him to his first Winston Cup championship. Herb was way, way, way good. Believe me, he was a good race car driver. Um, I know when he and Smokey were together, I mean, they were, they were awesome. Herb Thomas was a true pioneer, and his first championship was just... Teamed with flamboyant Smokey Eunuch, Herb Thomas etched out his place in NASCAR history. During that time, Herb's rival for both his championships was fiery Lee Petty. Yeah, he was a dirty racer. He won't appreciate that. But he's the guy that put me out of business in Darlington in 57. He did? Yeah. Yeah, Curtis had to run it one later and Lee run into him over in three. Bent the car all up, put Curtis in the hospital, and Weatherly finished the race. But um, I like Lee, and uh, I don't have to say that I like you driving that, do I? No. He was about finishing the race so he'd have some money. And naturally he wanted to win because it was more than uh, second place. But the main deal that they used to call him Mr. Consistency because he finished about every race he started. He, he managed somehow to miss most of the wrecks and get the very most out of his equipment without tearing up his equipment. A lot of these boys had come in and just like he's talking about the Herb Thomas in 54, you know, Herb would either win or blow up. When Daddy couldn't afford to blow up. So if he had to settle for second or third in order to get enough money to go to the next race, then that's what he did. 
With his second championship in 1953, Herb became NASCAR's first two-time champion. But it was his prowess at the super speedway of the day, Darlington, that commanded respect. Herb was the first three-time winner at the Tough Track, 1951, 54, and 55. An impressive feat for the era. You, you just can't appreciate today how difficult it was to bring these cars home back in those days. There was so much less engineering and sophistication about how to, how to do it, and they were running on such hostile surfaces. These dirt tracks were just terrible. And um, um, the fact that he could be as consistently fast and, and bring it home, particularly on the bigger money races, and I think Herb really made his reputation at Darlington. You know, that was, uh, that was a track that nobody um, seemed to look forward to much uh, then, which is one reason why it's such a great track, of course. But uh, he, he had no trouble with Darlington. He was a hard charger, but he was a smart race driver. Uh, he was one of those that recognized in his day that the technology was not there, that you could run that car as hard as it would go from start to finish and expect it to be there at the end. Although he worked on his own race cars and, and uh, a lot of times and, and uh, built them as good as he possibly could, but the parts and pieces that would let you run it hard just were not available. After winning 48 races and 39 poles in just 230 starts, Herb is 12th on the all-time NASCAR win list, four decades since he retired from racing. Several racing accidents cut his sensational career short. Herb had an accident um, a couple of years before he retired, and he came, and it was a pretty bad accident. He was um, it broke him up pretty good, um, and he came back after that. Uh, and I think Herb realized that he wasn't going to be as competitive as he had been and decided to do something else. And that was so vintage Herb Thomas. He was very successful. Through the decades, Herb's reputation as a true Southern gentleman defines his championships. He was almost bashful. He was a very uh, quiet uh, and unassuming guy that I could see, at least the Herb Thomas that I saw. And uh, wasn't... Uh, you know, just one of those guys that wasn't the best guy to interview. If you were a writer, he didn't have a lot of pithy things to say, but uh, but you respected him immensely. Herb was, uh, he was one of those people that was very private also. He did not, didn't care for the glitz and the glamour. And when it come time to, to run the race, that he was more comfortable in the car than out talking to people. Herb would be the steady guy that you knew was going to finish the race, and uh, uh, if at all possible. And he saw, uh, he knew that he had to get the points, that that was what he was going for. His impact was that uh, no matter where you're from, no matter how you were brought up, no matter what your uh, economic situation was that if you had the desire and you had some ability uh, you could be a champion. Herb Thomas was a true NASCAR pioneer. During the fun-loving 50s a motorcycle racer from Virginia livened up the NASCAR circuit. Joe Weatherly may have become the circuit's class clown but there was no doubting his ability behind the wheel of a race car. He was a professional, when he was on motorcycles, he was a professional rider. Um, and there wasn't a lot of money in the motorcycles. And there was more money in the cars, in NASCAR in particular. So he made the switch. Everything he did, he knew what he was doing. Uh, the, the guys that we had driving back in those days, there was nothing really wild about them. They had, they had the knowledge of what they were doing, but they put on some of the best shows you've ever seen. Dan Gurney uh, is of the opinion, who's one of the great drivers of history, that uh, motorcycle racing gives you a better feel for the combination of machine and surface than anything. And Joe was a great 
motorcycle. He was a champion motorcycle rider for many years. Weatherly won three AMA championships between 1946 and 1950 before focusing on stock cars full time in 1951 in NASCAR's modified division. For three years, starting in 1956, Joe concentrated on the NASCAR convertible series. And during this time, he befriended another high-spirited racing personality who knew no boundaries, Curtis Turner. The duo became legendary for their antics. The first race ever covered was at Asheville Weevil Speedway in Western North Carolina in 1958. And I was scared to death. I didn't know what to expect. Uh, but I had passes to get me about anywhere. And I uh, climbed a rickety uh, tower that was built on the start finish line in the infield out of two befores and planks. And so I figured I would go up on top of that and watch qualifying. And I got up there and there were two fellas there that I've recognized from their pictures. Both of them had helmets on their arms, dressed in slacks and sports shirts. And it was uh, Joe Weatherly and Curtis Turner. And this is about two hours before the race. And they were passing a pint of Jim Beam back and forth, drinking it straight out of the bottle. I said, gosh, this is a hairy-chested bunch here. These are real men. Uh, as it turns out, neither one of them drove that day. They didn't have a car. But uh, I'm sure they would have uh, driven, and they were preparing themselves for the excitement. Their friendship uh, probably should have been declared illegal, the, uh, or if not, uh, a, some sort of uh, thing to be studied. It was, uh, it was based on uh, a lifestyle around racing and I would say partying, but it was more than just partying. And there were many parties in the sense of uh, uh, speed weeks at Daytona, they located, it wasn't an accident that they located their shared uh, condominium or apartment that was right across the street from, one, from their favorite bar, Robinson's Bar in uh, Daytona Beach. But uh, they, uh, they, enjoyed ha ha they enjoyed the fun of life. He and Curt Curtis Turner, <laughs> I mean, they did things that you wouldn't even, well, you can't tell. I can't, I can't tell you about. Uh, biggest thing I remember is like they got into this thing where they'd throw firecrackers into the car when just before they qualified. And Turner had, uh, Curtis Turner had put a firecracker in Joe Weatherly's car the week before just as he starts to put it in gear to go out on the racetrack. So Weatherly stopped at a novelty store and he bought this thing, looked like a half a case of dynamite. It was that big around with a fuse in it that long. And Turner's inside the car at Darlington fixing to go qualify. Weatherly just went up and tossed it in right under his legs. Well, buddy, I'm going to tell you, there were dents all the way across the roof of that car where Turner was trying to get out. And when it went off, it went <laughs> <laughs> Him and Turner were real good pals and this stuff, you know. And when he outrun Turner, he always got out, you know. And he smile real big, so I outrun him today, you know, and this stuff, you know, and then when Turner would outrun him, you know, he'd go over there and pat him on the back. So, well, little man, you didn't do it today, you know. Joe's antics may have caught attention, but he backed them up with his driving. Joe Weatherly's reputation for fun followed him to Grand National Racing in 1960. The following year, Joe got the break of his career when team owner and champion mechanic Bud Moore asked Joe to drive his Pontiac. We started fixing Pontiacs for 1961, and uh, this is why, you know, I talked to the head people at Pontiac about driver and this stuff, and uh, I said, well, maybe we could get Joe Wedley to drive. And uh, so this is, we talked to Wedley, and he agreed, and uh, this is how we hired him, driving 1961. Bud wanted someone who could go fast, but also wanted someone who could take care of the equipment and make sure that the car lasted. And Joe was that kind of driver. He could, uh, if the car was really good enough, uh, he could run it uh, at the front. And if it was a fifth place car, he would run it in fifth until the last 20 laps and won a lot of races with a fifth place or a 10th place car. I think he approached it in the typical measured way that a good driver evaluates a new ride 
and once he got in it and they started running well together, then I think he was very happy. Uh, I personally never heard him say, this is the best break I ever had, but I think it probably was. In 1962, Joe won eight races en route to his first championship with Bud. It was all a good team, and everybody was a good team effort, and uh, everybody really loved Wadley because he, he was a heck, such a heck of a race driver and clowned around so much with everybody. And it was a good feeling for all of us, you know, to win the races we ran, and uh, especially win the championship and this stuff. And uh, it was a good deal for as Pontiac Motor Company was concerned to win the championship in the Pontiac because it never had been done before. But in 1963, things changed. Pontiac withdrew their support, despite Joe and Bud's success. Moore could only guarantee Joe so many rides in a Mercury, but that didn't deter Joe, who jumped in any car he could find and remarkably earned his second consecutive Grand National title with 35 top 10 finishes in 53 starts. That year, Joe was NASCAR's version of a um, guy who bums his way across the country on trains. Uh, he never knew from week to week, he knew which events uh, Bud Moore was going to have his car there for. Uh, but the rest of the time, Joe had to arrange bum a ride. Um, and he did it. And, and I mean, when you stop and think about getting in a strange car on a, and back then they ran dirt, they ran, uh, you know, there weren't that many super speedways. Of course, Darlington was there. That was um, uh, incredible that they were able to do that. Couldn't be done today by any stretch of the imagination. But back in the old days, uh, uh, fellas would help each other out with their cars. Joe was also very superstitious. Down at Darlington, they had, uh, instead of saying, uh, after the 13th Southern 500 down there, there never was a 13th Southern 500 because Weatherly was so superstitious that he was not going to run in a 13th annual anything. And he and Bob Colvin, who uh, was president of Darlington Raceway in the 50s, were very good friends. So uh, on behalf of Joe Weatherly, Bob Colvin called the 13th Southern 500 the 12th renewal of the Southern 500. And for many years after that, it was always renewal, not so-and-so annual Southern 500. In four short years, Joe Weatherly had won 25 times in Grand National Racing. Joe Weatherly was set to team up with Bud Moore for a full season in 1964. The team headed to Riverside, California with high hopes of a third title when disaster struck. We built 64 model Mercury Marauders to run in 1964. We go to Riverside, California, and uh, what happened, we sent the car out to Bill Strops about oh, a couple of weeks prior to the race because Ford Motor Company came out with some new brakes. And uh, you know, running Riverside, you had to have the very best brakes you could get. So uh, they took it out to Strop and they put on all new brakes, something other that they had came up with, and it was, was, it was some good stuff. And when we got into the race, uh, we hadn't run but maybe three or four laps, and Joe had lost second gear in the transmission. So we'd come in the pits, and about that time, they had a big pileup on the front straightaway. Uh, I don't know, 30 or 40 cars, and uh, meantime, Joe jumped out and said, put a transmission in, put a transmission in. And I said, Joe, we're gonna be, t put it, so we jacked the car up, and we put a new transmission in. The red flag, the race was flagged, red flag, and was stopped. And uh, we put a transmission in the car. And Joe got back out with only one lap down when they restarted the race. Anyway, we was running uh, during the race, and uh, Joe was running real hard, and we was running as fast as the lead cars. But the only thing about it was uh, Joe, had, he already knew he was a lap down. and. and I guess he had the idea he was going to try to make that lap up. And uh, he wore the brakes out pretty bad. And uh, one of the adjusters on the right front, where they had these automatic adjusters on them, adjust the brakes while the car ran. And the adjuster fell out. And when it did, it blew the wheel cylinder. And he lost the brakes going into turn five. And he had to make left hander in the five and then make a hard right hander in the six. When it did, the car got airborne and got into the wall. 
And Joe didn't wear no safety. Uh, he didn't wear a shoulder harness. And uh, he didn't like shoulder harness. He just wore a safety belt. And his body sort of went outside the car. And uh, that's when we lost him. The clown prince of NASCAR was gone. But his memory still brings smiles and respect from everyone who knew him. He was the type of person that built that great fan base and uh, there was always a little void there after, after his death because he was so much fun to be around and, and people just liked him a lot. And I think Joe's personality and his, um, the way he talked, uh, the way he uh, interacted with the media, um, Joe really helped the sport in that regard. I, I still don't think that uh, history will probably realize what a good driver he was, a cha what a champion he was, uh, in the sense that he only probably ran, I don't think championship was in Joe's mind for many years, for any years before he associated with Bud. As, as good as two national championships sounds, and, it's, and that, does, that is an achievement, he probably uh, might be a little underappreciated. Both Herb Thomas and Joe Weatherly would be sorely missed on the NASCAR circuit. Even today, Weatherly's name brings a chuckle to all who remember him, while Thomas continued his life on the road, starting his own trucking company and driving trucks for the next 20 years. Herb Thomas and Joe Weatherly, two men who will be forever remembered as NASCAR's early superstars. For NASCAR Past Champions, I'm Mike Joy. Thanks for watching.